And so now as we listen for the story of Jesus to be told that is recording in scripture, we say in unison our call to God's word. Scripture cannot be set aside. What does scripture say? And in unison, we pray for illumination. Lord, through your spirit, enable us to consider your word and to enact it in our lives to bring you glory and praise. Amen. So we're going to be reading today and recording this reading and the sermon from two gospel passages. The first is Matthew 13, where we're picking up where we left off last week. And the second, as we are already alluded to in our call to worship, is Luke 4. So I'm going to go ahead now and stop screen sharing and turn on my camera so that you can see, see me as I preach. You may want to go ahead and go to speaker view for this. As I said, I will be reading from these two gospel passages, Luke 13, or Matthew 13, and Luke 4. I would ask you to be patient through these readings and through the sermon, because we're going to be talking about something that we may not talk about in great depth often, and that is the idea of prophets and prophecy and prophesying. And Jesus his, well, himself was a prophet, but there were prophets who came before him as well. And they came to speak of the coming Messiah, Jesus. And so Jesus was born, and the story that's told of him, the events, the accounts in the gospel. And when he came of age, he was anointed in the power of the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And then he went into the wilderness to prepare for his ministry. And he spent time preaching and teaching about the kingdom and healing to show the signs of the coming kingdom and calling people to be his disciples in the kingdom. Now, as we come midway through Matthew, Jesus began to preach in parables. It was a different method of preaching and teaching because he began to see that people were resistant. He came to the lost sheep of Israel, but both the crowds and the religious leaders were resistant to the teaching. So he began to teach in parables. And this is where we pick up in Matthew chapter 13, verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Now, at a certain point in Jesus's ministry, he moved from Nazareth, his original hometown, the place where he was born, and made a new home along the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. This is not speaking about his hometown in Capernaum, but midway through Jesus's ministry, he actually returns to his original hometown in Nazareth, goes into the synagogue there and preaches. And it is there that the people speak of him and say this, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they ask? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Remember, we said at a certain point, Jesus stopped doing as many healings and miracles as he did because of lack of faith. And so the same is true, not just in Capernaum and the areas around Galilee, but also in Nazareth, his own hometown. But why were the people offended? If we just look at this passage, it might look as though it could be like when there's a child raised in our family or raised in our church or raised in the community and goes off to college or goes off to work and comes back later and maybe isn't received as a mature adult, but as still a little child, 
maybe this is an occurrence of this, especially because Jesus is not an educated person and someone rich and affluent. He is instead poor. He is of the working class and a carpenter's son. So are people wanting to keep the status quo? Quo, offended that Jesus isn't keeping his place. That could be what this is, but I don't believe that that is the case because if we look at the first time Jesus went preaching in his hometown of Nazareth, it shows us a different or a deeper scene. So we're going to flip now to Luke 4, if you'll turn there in your scripture, and verse 14. Now, this is just following Jesus' anointing of the Holy Spirit, his baptism, and his equipping that's in the desert, his testing in the desert. And this is what happens. Verse 14 says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So Jesus was received in those towns all around Galilee, at least at first, and was praised. But then, early in his ministry, after his time of moving around Galilee, verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. So Jesus, like us, on Sabbath, is accustomed to gathering in worship just as we are gathered in worship today. And why do we gather in worship? Well, this helps us understand better um, his empowerment in the Holy Spirit and also the idea of his being a prophet, and in fact, all prophets. So when we gather in worship, aren't we gathering to listen for the message from God for us for that day, for that time period? We hear it in scripture, but we also want to know how does it apply to our lives today? And we all should be gathering for the purpose of listening for God's word fresh for us today. The same was true in the synagogues. Everybody was there. Jesus went to synagogue. And then it says, so if we're waiting to hear God's word, who will be the one who speaks us? Well, apparently on this day, it's going to be Jesus. For it says, he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So at this point, no one has rejected him yet. He stood up and they accepted, oh, it could be Jesus who has a word, has a message for us today. In fact, they don't, they're not at all um, opposed to the idea. They actually hand him the scroll of Isaiah. Now, in synagogue, often, just as I, the preacher, am the one who selects the scripture reading, and I open it to the page that we're reading from, um, it is often that a person would do a scripture reading in the synagogue, but it would be opened and pointed to. But it's Jesus who's going to be preaching, who's going to be giving the message of truth from God, who has a prophetic word. And so he unrolls it. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. So Jesus chose where in the scroll of Isaiah from where he should read. And this is the call to worship that we heard. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus led through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, opened to this place in Isaiah. And is he rejected for this reading? I would think not. This is a a good word, a, a joyful word for the people to hear, for they are being oppressed by the Roman captivity. And so I would think it is favorable. Let's see if that is true. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. You see that? They heard the ancient word from Isaiah, the word of the Old Testament, but they're still listening to hear what is the message for how this applies to us today. They're looking to Jesus as the prophet, as the one delivering the message, just as you are listening to this message today, to hear what the word is today. And he tells them. Verse 21, he began by saying to them, 
today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. So he wasn't rejected. Even in applying the word from Isaiah 61 to that time in the synagogue in Nazareth. Now, when the one who receives the word of the, the Lord receives it, we're studying this in our Holy Spirit class. It is for them to speak it out loud to the people who are waiting to hear. And in the speaking, for it to be as a prayer, for the word to be fulfilled. And Jesus said just that. Today, this scripture is fulfilled to your hearing, in your hearing. And the people received it. So they didn't reject him for being Joseph's son, a carpenter's son at all. So we can't apply the assumption that that's why he was rejected either in Matthew 13. That's just two years, three years after this reading. And Jesus wasn't rejected for that. So why is he rejected? Now we continue in verse 23. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician heal yourself. And you will tell me, do hear in your hometown what you have heard that you did, what we have heard you, have, you did in Capernaum. So they're trying, Jesus is saying, they're going to start asking for those healings, even though there are those who have rejected his word and he stopped showing forth healing and miracles as much as he did original. And then here it comes, the matching of what we heard in Matthew 13. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. So now we come to where the appoint, point of offense is, is coming. It hasn't come yet. Jesus is not yet applying to the word, applying the word. And so listen to this reading. I assure you, this is in verse 25. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now, why did Jesus's quoting from the prophets in the historical books from the time of the kings affect them so badly? Well, for one thing, it looks as though there is a rejection of the people of Israel. Instead, it looks as though there is um, a choosing to act among the Gentiles and the people could be offended, but there could be another reason why. Let me share some of the history and background of this. First of all, Elijah was a prophet that was sent to guide the leaders of Israel, the kings of Israel, Ahaz and also Jezebel, but he was rejected. His word was rejected. His life was threatened and he had to run. And because the kings rejected and the people rejected the word of God, that is prophecy, guidance from God, a word from the time. The sky was shut up. There was a drought and a famine and Elijah went and sought, sought shelter according to the direction of the Lord with a widow in Zarephath. Now, where is Zarephath? It's in the same place where Naaman was from. If we would look at a map, there would be Galilee to the east, and the land in between moving west moves to the Mediterranean. And along the Mediterranean, there's a strip of land that is considered back then a portion of Syria, and it also moves to the north, if we would look at a map. Nowadays, it is called the land of Lebanon. So it's not part of Israel, and it wasn't a part of the nation of Israel even then. 
Tyre and Sidon and Zarephath were all part of Syria, not of Israel. So keep that in mind. However, it should have been a part of the nation of Israel. The first prophet in the, all of scripture is the prophet, the great prophet Moses, who wrote the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch. And he and Joshua, after they had left Egypt and went for 40 years through the wilderness, just as Jesus had just come from the wilderness for 40 days, heard word from the Lord that there was to be a nation established with portions of the land distributed to all the sons of Jacob, all the tribes of Israel. Not to Joseph, though. It was Joseph's, Joseph's two sons that received divisions of the land. But the land along the Mediterranean that is here considered Syria actually was to be a portion of Israel belonging to the tribe of Asher. Well, the people had heard the word of the Lord and had never, never was that land incorporated into the nation of Israel. There was a rejection of God's word. There was fear of stepping out in faith and, and obeying it. And so when Jesus quotes this, the people are remembering that although we think of this as pagan land and it, and it is, it's not supposed to have been. It's supposed to be part of Israel. So not only was Elijah rejected as a prophet, but so was Moses rejected as a prophet. And when Moses went to the Lord and said, these people are grumbling against me and rejecting me, God said this, they do not reject you, Moses. They're rejecting me. And they're rejecting my word. So from the time of the prophets starting from Moses and all the way up to Jesus, there was a tendency to reject the prophets and the prophets were actually setting forth the coming of the Messiah. So now we move back to Matthew 14 and we hear of that pattern of rejecting prophets. All the prophets of the Old Testament and even prophets of the New Testament continue and indeed it does. So look at Matthew 14 verse 1. There was a prophet that came in the spirit of Elijah, who was Jesus's cousin, John the Baptist, that was born slightly before Jesus and was to prepare the way of the coming Messiah. And indeed he did. And John acted as a prophet too. And here's his end of his story. Verse one, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus. And he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, strange thing to say, because Jesus was not born after John the Baptist's death. They were both alive the same time. So odd, Herod, Herod has the lives of Jesus and John the Baptist confused somehow. And this Herod is the son of Herod, who was ruling at the time of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Do you remember how Herod then, the father of this Herod, had ordered the death of all the male children under two years old? There was an attempt on Jesus' life by Herod's family. And now there is an attempt by this Herod on the life of John the Baptist. And why? Let's continue to listen. Verses three. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. So here is John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah coming to tell the truth, God's truth, according to God's word, to the leader of the nation of Israel, to Herod. And yet he is being rejected. The truth of God, God's word is being rejected in the way that Herod married. And so there's a rejection of John, a rejection of God, a rejection of God's word, and a threat of death. And it comes to pass. 
first six on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guest and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to, carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. So do we see the pattern of prophets being rejected, Old Testament prophets, and John the Baptist, who came in the spirit of Elijah, also being rejected, and also a foretelling of what is about to happen to Jesus. We'll see shortly after this, this is when Jesus begins to preach to his disciples and the people and saying that he was going to be killed. He knew too, he, as the prophet of all prophets, the, the Messiah was about to go by the way of all the prophets and to be rejected and killed and be put to death on the cross. He knew that the time of his suffering and his end of ministry on earth was to come to pass. But that wasn't the end of it. Because if those who were prophets of old and those who were prophets of Jesus were rejected, such as his disciples and apostles, most of whom were martyred, what of us? What if we would receive the word of God and would present it aloud and tell the truth? Will that be rejected? Jesus tells us, take up your cross and follow me. There is persecution of Christians throughout the world, and there's even rejection of us in this world today as God's word is rejected. Now, we could say that's the end of the message, and that's what we're supposed to hear. And it is to a degree, but it's not the complete message. Just as in Luke 4, Jesus gave a portion and then kept going. I believe that we're supposed to hear more. For Isaiah, who spoke to the kings, just as prophets before him, had been speaking to the kings also. He spoke at the time of Hezekiah, and I was reading last Sunday how Isaiah reminded the people and reminded the kings of how Ahaz and, and Jezebel had rejected God. And it says this in Isaiah 30, verses 8 and then verses 10. Go now, write it on a tablet for them. Inscribe it on a scroll that for days to come, it may be an everlasting witness. So the scroll of Isaiah was handed to Jesus. And in verse 10 of chapter 30 of Isaiah, it continues in this way. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. So the people, the kings, the religious leaders were asking only for pleasant prophecies, not to hear the fullness of the truth, such as Jesus gave, such as John the Baptist gave. And what happened then? For 500 years, there, was, there were no more prophets. From the time of the book of Malachi until the time that Jesus came, it was quiet. Prophecy was quiet. So I believe the word for us today is this. Here we are in a troubled time where just as then the world was affected in dark ways. The pandemic is among us. Civil unrest is among us. We've just heard the news of what happened in our state Senate. There is so much that is going on and we can't make sense of it. And we don't know the nature of this pandemic, exactly what's gonna happen. We don't have all that information. The only one who knows is God. 
So during a time such as this, isn't this a time? All times should be, but especially now when we can't possibly know. Don't we need to rely upon listening for God to direct us, to send us prophetic word, to tell us how his word, scripture, applies specifically to us today? Is this what we want? Or will we reject the prophets? Will we reject the word of God? and its application. It is up to us to decide. Shall we be guided in the power of the Holy Spirit? Shall we listen closely for the word of God? For we surely need it now. In Jesus' name, amen.